There's nothing more intriguing than watching one of these brightly coloured tips out in the dark water disappear and the anticipation of what's going to be attached. Float fishing, in this case a waggler float, is probably the most common form of fishing and the one that most people perceive when you describe fishing, it's that float fishing, watching that brightly coloured tip disappear under the water. So you're joining me here today at Springvale Fisheries, just away from Retford in North Nottinghamshire, at a fantastic fishery that's full of fish and we're going to have a simple day's fishing, waggler and in this case we're going to use maggot as, a, as bait and we're going to try and target the wide variety of species that these fantastically stocked lakes contain. So I'll kick off by just talking you through the tackle that we're going to use to approach a day's fishing and it's quite a traditional setup. I've got a 13 foot float rod, it's a three piece float rod and very common uh, float, you know, lots of people make these types of products but this is a beautiful rod that I've had for quite a few years and the difference between a float rod and a ledger rod is that this is ordinarily longer because you want to use it for casting the float and picking up the line and it's a straight through carbon uh, blank because ultimately you're not watching it as a uh, indicator or casting big weights it's for use in for light weights for floats and therefore you need an action that suits it but traditional 13 foot there's some great 12 and 11 foot models on the market these days but I've gone for my traditional style on that I've got a nice small reel and it's important to match your rod and reel uh, in size this is um, like a 4000 series which is ample it's big enough spool to be able to cast your line freely uh, with enough winding power but not too big that it's bulky when you're attaching it to a rod like this because ordinarily you will be holding your rod so you don't want a big heavy reel and that's why I choose a rod that and a reel that matches us, us together now on that is um, a four pound line in this case it's an 018 diameter that's a sinking line detection uh, one of ours that we uh, use for this kind of fishing and that's straight through then to a waggler and a waggler floor is call that because it waggles um, and it's been called that for, for since god will lad now that's a bottom end only attachment so you'll see that it, it rotates around the line and i've got that attached to my line with a nice uh quick change uh silicon adapter that drennan does are really good they've got a swivel in the bottom and i've attached that to my line with some uh, sort of gummy stops and I've used two above it and two below it because this is a fully loaded float and what I mean by that is that it's got a big lump of um, lead brass or, or some kind of weight in the bottom which also aids casting so you can use split shot if you have a float that has no loading you can use bigger shots to get the weight capacity and which you use for, for casting the float basically that is around 10 inches in length and in the top it's got a quite sensitive tip and we we should always try and use the lightest float that we can with the most sensitive tip and I'll explain that in detail a bit later on on this uh, particular rig I've got some trimming shot which are and I've used number eight stots today because I believe that that's probably the most common uh, type of shot that's used you know in our um, sort of fishing areas in, in our country this, this you know these days they've kind of overtaken normal split shots if you prefer split shots you know it's something i do like but i've used that just to kind of align us with what i expect you the viewers to be using they're dead easy because they've got a nice easy uh, big slot in them that means they can attach it to the line and then further down the, the line i've got one two three four of those number eights as well and i've used number eights because as i said they're big enough to be able to use and you can see them register as you're watching your float. You can use smaller shots, you can use bigger shots, but I've just used that um, for this purpose because I think that'll allow me to get a nice slow enough fall or I can bulk them together to create uh, a bulk rig, which we'll talk about you know, as we go through it. And then attached to that, I've got a 10 inch up length and I've started off on a nice small 16 barbless suck because we're probably gonna be fishing maggots today and that catches everything. And it's a simple setup and we're going to talk you through how we use it, how we feed those maggots and we're going to read the swim and explain things as we go and talk you through our day session. So one of the first jobs when you float fishing is to plumb the depth. Now it's important to understand how deep the area is that you're fishing because I think that 
regardless of whether you're fishing on the bottom or on the top, you need to know exactly where the fish are in relation to that. So when you're feeding and fish are coming up in the water, you can understand it. And then if they seem to sort of go down and if you're feeding in a way that pushes them towards the bottom, then you know how deep you need to be to get down there. So what we do is we, we plumb the depth, find out what the depth is, and then mark it on our rod. And then at least we've got a point of reference as we go through. Now, plumbing the depth with a waggler isn't always that easy, especially if you're fishing a little bit further out. And the most common way to plumb the depth is obviously with a plummet. This one is 15 grams, which I think is actually a little bit heavy for waggler fishing, although we can, we can use it. But there are other ways of doing it. You can either uh, just clip a, a big split shot onto your line. You can put uh, a pellet band inside a split shot and then hook the rubber band if you want it to be safe. Or you can get yourself a, a tiny little plummet that you can cast. But just to show you with, with this particular one, I'll just give you some idea how we can do it, which is I'm going to underhand it because we're not fishing too far. And we're just flicking that out there like that. And what we're looking for is the fact that the float is actually, I can still see the float. So the plummet, the weight of the plummet has not pulled the float under the surface. Now, I've been here before, so I've got a rough idea how deep this place is. And it's roughly, that's about five foot maybe. So I'm just going to move my float by sliding down my shots, the couple of shots that I use for trimming the float to get the balance right, and then I'm just pulling those rubber stops, and they're brilliant because they slide on the line, they don't damage the line, and it just allows you to move your float with ease. When you're using split shots, when you've got a non-loaded float, it's, you know, you have to be a bit careful with the shots because sometimes they can just damage the line and you don't really want that. So I'm just flicking that plummet out there again. And that immediately was just pulling my float down, but it's just popped back up and it's barely, in fact, there it is, look, it's, so we're almost near the depth. So just to be sure, because I did get a, a sight of that float, I'm going to put it down another few inches and you can just keep repeating this process until you get an exact, um, you get the exact depth because you know exactly where the float is sitting in relation to the bottom. Your plummet's pulling your float underneath and away you go. And there it is, it's dead easy because that's only about four or five rod lengths out. Yeah, and that's definitely pulled my float under. So that's, that's the depth. And what I'm now gonna do is mark that off against my rod so that I've got a reference and that in my mind is a couple of inches shallower so we just remember that for when we start marking it up there's a hook keeper just underneath the rod handle here which makes it nice and easy just to hang my hook on it and then what I'll do is just put my rod down and remember that with a waggler of course it's a float that's sitting up like that. So I fold it back against the rod and I'm just going to take a marker. I'm just going to mark on my rod the tip of the float because I know for a fact that was sort of bang depth. And then I'm just going to push my float up, make my stoppers up and my shots so that I know I've got a float length because that's where I'm starting a float length of line on the bottom. And the reason why I do that is because when I'm starting to fish, I don't know what we're gonna catch. We're gonna lose feet on bait, and I always like to start on the bottom. If the fish come up in the water, I can shallow that up. But ordinarily, when you're fishing through the water, you don't always fish shallow. You want a little bit of line, long, deeper than what you actually wanna catch the fish. So the rest of the, the lines fall, and the hook baits falling through the water, it's a little bit more gentle, but I'll, I'll explain that to you as we go through it. And if the fish come up, we'll be able to adjust it. So I'm probably three quarters of that length of float over depth, which with a 10 inch float, that's sort of eight inches or so over depth. And that'll just give us a little bit of stability and the float won't be drifting along uh, in, in any kind of tow or wind that we have. And that is pretty simple. As I said earlier, my shot shotting pattern there is dead simple. I've just got the four number eight spread out over the line, which will allow a nice gentle fall. And with that finest tip on this particular waggler, 
that means I'll be able to read those shots falling through the water. So that's a simple way to set up, but we'll talk more in depth as we go along. But let's get fishing and show you what we're going to do. I can't think of a better way to catch fish than on a waggler. So fishing this method, I mean it's float fishing, it's basic float fishing, but the way that we're going to do it today is just that we can apply this simple straightforward method to most venues, especially still waters. And the top and bottom of it is there's a few fundamental things that you need to consider when you're fault fishing. Now, I'm fishing that a little way out, four or five rods. But I would say to you, rule number one is make sure that you can feed where you want to fish. Now, today we've not got a lot of wind. And when you're float fishing, wind is a massive impact in, in as much as um, you've got a lot of line between you and your float, which can be affected by the wind. So it's really important that you can reach the spot that you want to fish, you can reach it with your float and you can reach it with your bait. Don't overstretch yourself, really important thing to think about. And I'm just loose feeding a pouch of maggots to, to start us off with, because I think that, look at that, absolutely solid with fish this place which is why we chose it so we can show you how these different things apply to this method and just start off nice and simple by loose feeding some maggots and you can do the same thing with other baits like casters or you can use pellets a lot of you know commercial fisheries these days respond to pellets um which should be you know for carp and stuff but it's one of the cooler months and it's a great time to catch what we call silverfish, which is bream, roach, eyed, chub, skimmers, hopefully an odd tench, maybe a cruising. But generally, you know, um, all types of, of what, like I said, we call them silverfish. So, rule number one, make sure that you can reach your bait with your catapult or by hand if you're feeding by hand. And then also make sure you can reach with your float. Don't overstretch yourself. And because we're fishing a little bit further out, it's one of the main reasons why I've chose this sinking line. Because we've got a, a bit of a wind coming across us here. So if you were pleasure fishing, you might choose to fish with the wind off your back. But for purposes of explaining the effects of wind, we've sat with it across us today so we can show you and each cast I'm just going to feed a good generous pouch of maggots because we know there's so many well I didn't realize there were this many fish in it but there's a lot of fish in here so we need to make sure that we've put enough bait in to feed what I call the peripheral fish the fish that are taking the bait snatching it small fish fish taking it on the drop and what I mean by that is on the drop is as the bait falling through the water that's another skimmer look um, and allow enough of those maggots casters or whatever it is that you're feeding to, to fall through the water and reach the bottom because catching fish mid-water is great but it's not always as easy as catching them on bottom if you can get your fish to go down onto the bottom it's a bit more effective bites are easier to eat you get less uh, missed bites you get less false bites by that i mean line bites where the fish are thrashing around up in the water chasing those loose offerings and giving you line indications i.e false bites or liners as we like to call them so the idea is that you feed enough maggots or your chosen bait to make sure that you're feeding all the elements of the fish that might be in your swim so a few a few for the little ones a few for falling through and a few to reach the bottom so that we're covering all our bases which ultimately leads to being able to get your bait to fall through the water and which is what it's actually doing now i've just cast in 
you'll notice that as it hits the water, I drip me, I put my rod tip under the water, retrieve the line at quite a sort of fast pace. And the idea of that is that, oh, I bumped that fish. The idea of that is that it sinks the line. So it just breaks the surface tension of the water and allows the, the line to cut through and just sink nicely which the effect of that is that and it's probably really important the thing that most people overlook when they're telling you oh you must sink your line the reason is because you've got a lot of line between you and the float and what happens is that side wind will grab that line and of course what you finish up with is a big bow in your line and the wind will grab the line and, and push it and it'll drag it down the lake creating a big bow which then what happens is there's loads of bites here, that, there's so much just said to go with that already. What happens then is that line gathers pace in the wind and it pulls your float off track and it pulls it away from the baited area. But more importantly, it starts to drag your hook bait along with it, which creates an unnatural um, presentation of your bait. So we're loose feeding our, in this case, maggots, and they're falling through the water at the sort of um, flow of the water, which in this case is slightly to the right, but so they're more or less going down vertically. And then if you can imagine, you've got the wind grabbing your line, pull, pulling it off, in this case, to the left, which means your float's getting dragged along and your maggot or your hook bait is getting dragged along the bottom or even worse, as it's falling through mid water and it would be so natural to the fish and they just won't take that bait. And that were a missed bite, so we've gone quick couple of fish and then we've missed a few bites so what I'm actually going to do which is something that you can try is feed before you cast and that swim just went a little bit quiet then for a couple of casts and I presumed it would be a carp and that one just took that up bait as it at the surface so obviously that's a shallow feeding fish which is quite interesting because it's cold but yet there's still a bit of colour in the water so they'll have the confidence to feed and of course we're loose feeding maggots which can sort of encourage the fish to come up in the air and the reason why that were a fierce bite and a fierce take is because it's a chub and that's the beauty of maggots they catch everything including stunning fish like that chub there look and they love to surface feed and that is hooked right in the edge of the mouth single maggot cracking fish and the swimmer just gone quiet and I'm, not, I'm sure it's not that particular fish that caused that I felt like it might have been a carp and understanding what's happening in your swim is, is quite important because I've had that chub I'm just going to feed before I cast this time which can be a, a devastating way of catching fish because what actually happens is that your maggots are sinking through the swim and I'm now casting over the top of it and as I rewind and sink my line it means that the floor is going to disappear and that would an immediate bite which I sadly missed um, it means that your, your hook bait is going to be fall, falling behind the pouch of loose feed that you've just fed rather than your hook bait going through the water first and then you're loose feeding off the back of it and trying to catch it up if the fish are on the bottom then it doesn't always matter if you feed before or feed after but if you're catching fish what we call on the drop or falling through the water as the bait is settling then sometimes it pays to to feed first because you're trying to get your hook bait to fall through the water at the same time as your loose feed and that just means that there's more chance of the fish intercepting your bait while it's going through the loose offerings that you that you that you're loose feeding so sometimes mixing that up can be quite important if we want to fish more on the bottom sometimes a good way to feed is by loose feeding two lots of uh, maggots together at the same time which will push the fish down to the bottom because there's not enough um, fish there to cope with the amount of bait 
so it means that you're forcing the fish down onto the bottom. So I'm just going to try that again by loose feeding first. Before we cast, loose feed and then just cast over the top, slightly just past it and then draw the float back into the bait and then that'll mean that the, the maggots are settling will be two or three foot down by the time you've cast your rig in and then it falls through because of course we have to have um, a few shots on the line so we can watch the float settle and as those shots fall through the water you'll see your float j slowly sinking and settling down to the desired uh, amount now of course that all depends on how far you're fishing uh, and how good your eyesight is make sure you can see your float don't try and fish with your float too dotted close to the water so um, you can't see it it's very important that you can see your float and read your float and understand what's happening that looked like it lifted up um, because then you can read whereabouts in the water the fish are intercepting your bait if you float if you're looking at them four number eight stots for instance as they're falling through and you can see when the float first lands there's more floats showing because the weight of those shots down your line is not registering on the float and if you get to the point where your float's not settling in at the speed it should do you know that something's probably intercepted your bait uh, high up in the water or shallow as we say it and you can strike at that because it means that you've there's one holding the bait up and it's actually stopping the shots from settling but by reading those four shots if your float settles right down to the desired amount where you've set it because of course that all depends on how much shot you put on then you know that your hook bait's got to the bottom and that is a great example of that that actually was just as the last shot settled and of course there's almost 12 inches between my bottom shot and the hook because of course it's a 10 inch hook length and then you've got the two loops that I've used to attach it so that's about 12 inches between my bottom shot and the hook so that last 12 inches is quite an important time for when you're most likely to get get your bite because your bait is almost near the bottom and I always think that fish don't sit right on the bottom they sit just off the bottom because obviously they're swimming they're suspended and that sort of last foot is a, the killing zone and if you can get your fish to go down that is the place where you'll catch them ordinarily most often so you watch your first shot second shot third shot your float sinks nicely and then that last little bit is and it'll just carry on going this chuck for instance that's all settled i can see all my shots are registered on my float so i now know that within a few seconds that last foot that i'm talking about that's settled and my hook bait is on the bottom now and um, so you can read you can read what's happening and because we've got that extra to eight inches over depth, I know that I've got a nice stationary bait, which hopefully encourages to catch bigger fish, especially when it's cooler, the weather's cooler like this. If you were fishing in the summer, the chances are that the fish would be high up in the water. You might want to fish uh, in the shallower parts of your swim, you know, further up in, in, in the water. Uh, and you can fish a, your float at mid-depth or even less than that, especially on some of the modern styles of float fishing like pellet waggler, where you're basically casting on a regular basis, hoping that the fish are intercepting your bait right up near the surface. But in this case, it's cooler. The fish are more likely to be closer to the bottom. And with maggots like this, the chances are that that's the right method but most importantly is to work it out and by setting off in a set fashion which we've done with plumb the depth we've got the float set just over full depth 
with a nice slow fall with the shotting pattern we've used it means that we're searching the whole column of water that's in our peg the five foot and we're reading what's happening now we've had some bites on the bottom we've had some bites mid water and we've actually had a bite off the surface with that chub so i think this sort of traditional spread shot pattern is probably the right way to fish to start off to fish um, because it's given us the options of catching at all the different levels in this peg. Choosing the right float to fish with is probably quite an important part of this style of fishing because of course um, we're on a still water and ordinarily still waters lend themselves to what's called a waggler. Now that's a broad term because a waggler is any float that's attached at the bottom and named so because I mentioned earlier it waggles around. Now the bottom end fixing um, more often than not is used on still waters because it allows the line to go subsurface. So ordinarily you're going to be casting in like we're doing, sinking the line and you want your, water, your line to be underneath the water so it's not affected by wind or tow. So these are three examples of wagglers. This one is a bodied waggler, which you might see in your tackle shop, and that's called a body waggler because it's got this big lump of balsa at the bottom. It's made from peacock, in this one in particular, and it's got this balsa body, which the reason for that body is that it adds weight carrying capacity. So the same float without a body might take three grams of uh, loading, this one will take six because it's got this extra body that's buoyant and will add buoyancy and you need to add extra weight. Ideal if you want to chuck a lot further or if you want to have lots of lead, uh, sort of extra weight down the line if you want to fish in deep water or whether you want to get your bait to the bottom quickly. And that just allows that extra capacity so you can lock it off with uh, some shots or you can sort of put the load in further down. Next one is a straight waggler. Now, this one, ordinarily for me, would be more suitable for uh, rivers um, because it, the thickness allows it to cope with the drag that's on the bottom and it won't pull under so easily. But it can be used on the still water and this is ideal if you've got a lot of movement on the water and, and maybe some waves and some ripples or if you want to use a bigger bait because if you want to use a bigger bait and it's off the bottom, the sort of... Um, loading of the bait, the, the weight of the bait, could pull a fine tip under, under the surface, whereas this one will just be buoyant enough to support that bait. Or if you're getting lots of little knocks and twitches, which could be line bites, which we'll mention, then this will just iron out the line bites and false bites, and when that goes under, you'll know it is a bite. And then the type of float that we're going to choose for today's uh, type of fishing is what's known as an insert uh, waggler and that's because it's a straight straight stem and then at the top it's got a thinner piece of material inserted into the top. The reason for this is sensitivity. So when you've got shy biting fish or you're fishing for smaller fish then that allows um, when the fish takes the bait and it pulls like that there isn't the buoyancy as there would be with a thicker tip float and that means that they don't feel the resistance and under it goes. If the water's not moving, because it's a still water, not a river, or it's not towing through too much, then always choose the light, the, the slimmest float tip that you can get away with. But most importantly, make sure you can see it, because if you can't see it, then you can't fish properly. But for me, the thinnest tip you can use, the more sensitive, that is ordinarily the best thing. The only time you don't want to do that is, as I said, if you're getting false bites. Now, the last thing to mention is, if you're choosing a float, is whether it's loaded or not loaded. Now, these, these two here, they're not loaded. That's just a little plastic connector at the bottom. And that means that all the capacity of the float is going to be added by you, the weight carrying capacity. So, for instance, this one is 5 BBs in its loading, which will relate to about 3 grams. Uh, but you might want to check up on that. I'm, I'm just quoting off the top of my head. And that means that you will be able to add 5 BB shots and that will load the float. Whereas this one here, this is uh, a gram and a half loaded float, but 1.25 grams of that is already on the float. It's loaded into the bottom and that's a self-weighting float. So if you just go to put that in the water, which I'll show you, that will sort of self-cock to the most of it. Then that allows you, and when you look at our rig, it's got 
uh, seven number eights on it so that means that that leaves you trimming shot and shot to push down the line so you can read your floor and also read your bait and push the bait through the water so that will just give you sensitivity but enough weight carrying capacity with a load of float to be able to do what you need to do with your shotting pattern so depending on what you're trying to do depending on how you choose it they're the choices and when you go into a tackle shop to have a look at just check to see whether you want a preloaded float so you can just lock it off like i've done with some rubber stoppers or whether you want an unloaded float so you can put the shots around yourself or push them further down the line it's it seems complicated but it's not it's dead simple if you just rule it down to sensitivity and preloaded and weight carrying capacity that will cover you for all your needs when you're float fishing now that bite were a, quite a long time coming so that's clearly on the bottom now that's why it's really important to sink your line especially if you're waiting for bites because that means that your line between your rod tip and your floor is under the surface and it's not been affected like I mentioned earlier by the by the crosswind which also means that your float is going to stay stationary over the top of your bait, if that float is moving on a still water where the water is not particularly moving, then I'm afraid your bait's going to look unnatural. So line choice is really important depending on how you're trying to fish. So for instance, if you were pellet waggler fishing, you might consider using a floating line because you were fishing on the surface, you don't want it to sink so you can pick it up quite quickly but in the case of the last cast where we're waiting for the bait to get to the bottom and it's sat there and we're waiting for a bite you don't want any effect from the outside elements so you need to get that line underneath the surface like we're doing by casting past our target baited area and then as i mentioned earlier dipping the rod under the water and winding it back through so line choice is a massive part of deciding how you think you're going to be fishing now I know it's not always possible to predict how you're going to fish but experience as you do more fishing or you do more float fishing that will start to build for you and you'll understand right I'm probably going to be fishing on the bottom it's cold weather we're fishing for silver fish like skimmers like the last two fish we've had so ordinarily I'm going to be fishing on the bottom and for that choice you want a good sinking line and then line diameter or breaking strain depend you know some people um, choose their line by diameter and some choose it by breaking strain but both of those measures are equally important um, and, and have their own place in your decisions and for me obviously quite clear the thinner the line the lighter the breaking strain but you might choose them for, the, for very different reasons and it will affect how you fish um, in which in what you choose so for this type of fishing, for me, you want quite a thin line. I've chosen an 018, which the knot strength of this particular line, the knot strength is four pound. The linear strength is, is more than that. And so you've got to make that choice as well. But the reason why I want a thin line is because I want to fish with the lightest float I can. And the thinner the line, the lighter the float that you can use because you haven't got the resistance from the line when you're casting it's not dragging on your reel dragging through your, your rings on your rod so it means you can use a two gram whereas if for instance i wanted to use a six pound line i'd probably have to use a three gram float to be able to cast the same distance because of the drag so just consider that and try and match it up where you can i mean if you were fishing close in the edge anyway you were loose feeding bait you know, sort of just here, you could use a thicker line, um, you could use a six pound or an eight pound, which would be 023 diameter or, or 26 diameter. If you were fishing for carp or big fish and you wanted to use a, a thicker line, a heavier line, for that reason, for breaking strain, then all that would mean is you would have to up the size of your float to be able to cast it, because you can't cast light floats on thick, heavy line because it just doesn't flow off the reel in the same way that a thin line does. So think about your choices. Use your experience as you build it up over, your, over the time when you're float fishing and you'll, you know, you'll learn that, that it goes hand in hand. So 
the lighter the line, the lighter the float you can use. But you have to consider the quarry of fish that you're targeting. Um, but when it comes into, you know, sort of the colder months especially, you'd be surprised what you can get away with uh, in diameters for the size of the fish that you can catch. You don't always have to use a massive, uh, you know, heavy line to catch big fish when the fish are slowed down, they're a little bit more lethargic. And of course, when you're using a nice soft uh, rod like we are today, you'll be quite surprised what you can catch, what size fish you can catch with diameters of line. And of course, to build into that, you've got your hook length uh, breaking strain. Now I'm using quite a light one because I know we're fishing for silverfish and I want to maximise the amount of bites that I'm going to get. So I've actually got an 010 diameter line on here. So ultimately my 018 main line is far, far stronger. It's almost double the, the thickness, of course, of, of my hook length. So any kind of um, sort of weak link is going to be around the hook length, which I know with the rod I've got, um, it'll handle this kind of hook length quite quite well but if you're using a you know a thicker up length always try and just put your uh, main line one one grade above that just to give yourself the weak link option and that were a lovely bite because that just settled on the bottom I mean it's sitting absolutely fantastic that float is and there's plenty of bites and there's a few fish sort of milling around I get an odd indication we've had a couple of bites as the, as the hook's fallen through the water. But ordinarily, like I mentioned earlier, by feeding, I think, quite positively, and what I mean by that is quite a few maggots in one go, that's pushing the fish down into the sort of lower parts of my swim. And that's a cracking skimmer. And allowing me to catch them on the bottom, which, if you can, especially this time of year, try and get the fish down in, into the, the lower parts of your swim cracking skimmer if you want to try and bring the fish further up in the higher levels of water in your swim then the way to do that would be to actually feed less maggots or less bait more often so that's kind of just the contrary to what I'm actually doing which is feeding large amounts of bait not so often in the hope that as that bait's sinking, it draws the fish to the bottom with them. If you want to pull them up in the water, feed probably a quarter of the amount that I'm feeding, but feed them twice as often, three times often as four times often. You can even get down to feeding half a dozen maggots and flicking them in and constantly trying to bring, because there's less of them, and that'll bring the fish up in the columns of water, and that would about on the drop. Um, and bring them close to the surface. But in my experience, it makes them harder to catch. So stack the odds in your favor by getting them fish further down in the water, which will result in less false bites, less missed bites, and more fish landed. So in this session, we're using this two gram float, which is coping with the conditions perfectly. It's casting to the required distance. It's coping with the light, slight breeze we've got. But often in wide open waters like this, it might mean that you have to change your float. And that can be, you can change it for a smaller float if the fish are coming up in the water, or you want to fish a bit closer, or if the wind gets up or the tow moves, you might need to go to a larger float. And one of the reasons why I set it up like I did when I mentioned it to you on a quick change adapter, is that that means I can just pull that stem out of that rubber, which is on a swivel on my line, and I can swap out the float. Now, fortunately, this particular floor also comes with its own interchangeable system because this is a Drenum floor that allows that. But if you're not fortunate enough to have one of these and you've got a normal float with the plastic adapter on the bottom, then these little float adapters like that, which aid the float to swivel on your line because there's a built-in swivel in the bottom, and that rubber tube means you can swap your float mid-session if the conditions change or you feel you want to fish in a different spot. So a nice little tip for you just to you know understand why we might connect this float like we do for interchangeability. So I just want to touch on shotting patterns. We set off today with the spread, sort of traditional style spread, which 
I've got four number eights spread up my line. The first one is around 12 inches away from the hook because obviously I've got a 10 inch hook length. Then I've got another one 12 inches above that and then the gaps get smaller. That one's about 8 inches and so is that one above it. Now the idea of that was so that we get a slow fall through the water and we search all the different columns of our swim. But by having the trimmer shots that I mentioned earlier, which currently are tucked up underneath my float, I can actually pull them down and pull them into place. So at the moment they're acting as part of the, the float's loading. And just by sliding all those shots down, I can change how I fish. So what I'm actually going to do is just pull the bottom two closer together. So I've got one just above the hook length, one eight inches above that, and then eight inches above that, I've now got four number eights all bulked together. And that means that what I will have is a condensed weight. So when I'm casting in, the condensed weight will sink my bait, my hook length, basically faster than it was before. So I'll get a quicker fall through the water. Now that can do two things. It pushes it through those upper columns, which means you get away from small fish if you're getting bothered, uh, or if you're getting false bites, it'll push it down. Or the other advantage I have with that is that if you have got some movement on the water, you'll get this weight, it'll push and hold your line and hold your rig and it'll, it'll stop drift. So if you want to fish a little bit more over depth, pull your shots down, creating more of a bulk rig, that'll give you a more stable rig and that means you can hold your bait stiller for longer. And just to um, you know, show you that, I'll just cast in and ordinarily it would take in three or four seconds for the hook to reach the bottom but now when I cast in, immediately those four number eights are pulling the float down, which I can already see. And then the last two shots are just settling the float. So immediately it means that two thirds of my rig has got through the water very quickly. So I'm pushing my hook bait down closer to the bottom quicker, which means I'm cutting it through. If I were trying to reach the bottom quicker or eliminate the small fish or create stability, then that is a great way to um, give you that advantage and that will allow you to, you know, make your float work in a different way to what you would do if you were spreading it out. And by the same um, token, you can actually spread those shots out even further. And where I had four shots spread across the length of my rig, I could actually push a couple of those right up underneath the float so that two thirds of my loading was underneath my float and then just have two number eights further down the line, which would mean I'd have the complete opposite effect and my bait would be falling through the water more slowly, thus giving the fish more chance to take the bait and intercept it on the fall, which can be a fantastic way of fishing. As I mentioned earlier, when you're loose feeding, if you just want to put a few less in, then you'll encourage the fish to come up in the surf, uh, this, you know, upper layers of the water, um, and you can catch them by allowing your bait to be suspended for longer up in those upper areas. So increasing the chances of catching shallow, which you can do, but as I said, I personally like to try and get the fish further down towards the bottom. I find that the are more in control and it results in more fish. Now, as it happens, I've cast that out and that's not gone straight away. So maybe that is not the right way to fish today and having it falling through slower just gives that sometimes the fish more chance to, to grab the bait. And remember that you don't always see immediately when a fish has taken your bait. And sometimes that little, like sort of last foot and a half, two foot, where it's one number eight, is interacting with your float and it's pulling it down, the fish might have intercepted it. And before it moves off, you can be a few seconds before you've seen it. And that's the advantage of fishing in a lighter way with a more delicate rig, is that it just allows the fish a little bit more slack to take your bait you don't always have to um, have the everything nailed down and strike at every single movement give the chance uh, the fish more chance to grab your grab your bait and that'll increase your bites so most important thing is to move and change and swap about and have that in your armory for when you are fishing and that means you've got more versatility in your rig and that means you'll catch fish more often on different days as conditions change so we've been catching skimmers Eyed, we've had chub, we've had roach, and it's been quite sort of hectic. Plenty of bites, lots of bites on the drop, 
And then for the last two or three casts, I actually didn't even have a bite. And you know, you start to wonder what, if your feeding pattern's wrong, if the fish have moved, if you need to change something. And then lo and behold, I think I found the reason why this wind went slightly quiet because I've just cast in and there's the bait at the bottom, a real positive bite. And now I'm attached to one of the resident carp in this venue, which has decided that it wants to go the opposite way to that I want it to go. And off, off it goes up the lake. And as I mentioned earlier that, I mean, I've only got a small 16 on, you know, when I say small, a lot of rooks have got their own sort of size ranges. And this particular one, this is a Camasan B510, is in a 16. And that's what I call an old size, old, old size 16. Um, some of the more modern hooks are quite big for their stated size. But just find a hook for you that you think suits the bait that you're fishing with um, and, and the type of fish you're fishing for. This one's been perfect for me today. I think single maggot, sometimes you can get away with a lot smaller hook than you think. And as I said, that's tied to an O10 diameter line. And because of the nature of the rod, which is quite forgiving, I managed to absorb the initial surge of this fish, which decided it wanted to uh, swim in the opposite direction. And it's surprising what you can actually get out. Now, if you were coming to a venue like this in warmer weather, then I think, you know, it wouldn't make any sense to fish with the diameter line and the size up that I've actually gotten today you'd want to increase the diameter and the breaking strain. And when the water's warm and the fish are active, the color of the water will definitely be more, um, you know, a more chocolatey color. And you can get away with thicker lines and it's not uncommon to fish sort of or 16 or 18. And you'll still get bites of everything because fish are a little bit more active, but because of the nature of them and they go a little bit more dormant, it does increase bites and your fish catching if you do reduce diameters and up sizes as the water cools down. But the beauty of modern tackle and modern line is that you can actually catch quite good fish on, on lighter equipment. So, you know, I think a lot of people do get confused with, well, if I'm catching eight pound carp, do I need an eight pound line? Well, no, you don't. What you need to do is make sure that you've got your anti-reverse on or your clutch set, which I had, sorry, your anti-reverse off and your clutch set, which I had both. And you'll notice that when I'm fishing, I've got the rod in my hand. I don't have it on a rest. And I've also got my hands on, on the spool. And that's so that I can fish with the anti-reverse off and stop the reel from sort of spinning backwards and creating tangles. But what it does give me the advantage of is if I do get a fish that wants to pull away from me quickly, I can allow it to take some line and I can backwind and let the fish run accordingly. And sure enough, that means I can land big fish on light tackle. Like this little beauty that we've got here and that's a really good fish and I'm going to say that he's at least eight pounds in weight just and he's up lovely in the in the lip with that small hook and that light line it does allow you to catch roach skimmers eyed and chub and the occasional beautiful carp like that one what a beauty. And that's a great way to finish off our float fishing session. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've learnt a few things. And we try and do a few tutorials on our YouTube videos. 
So if you like what you've seen today, then feel free to like and subscribe to our channel, New Fish, and we'll see you on the next one.